I'd like to welcome uh, our next speaker uh, to the stage. Uh, our next speaker is Neil Reby, uh, who's the uh, Rothschild Professor uh, for this program. Um, and uh, this program's all about bringing together uh, mathematicians and uh, uh, scientists. Uh, Neil has really made his career straddling the, the, the boundaries between the, uh, the two subjects. Uh, he's a superb uh, fluid dynamicist, uh, well known for his uh, powerful insights and very simple uh, fluid mechanical models and scalings and uh, asymptotics, uh, and I'd, I'd like him to come up to the stage and talk to us about the Hawaiian plume. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon, and thank you for that very generous introduction. I'd like to begin by thanking the, the Rothschild Visiting Committee, or Selection Committee, for their choice. I'm, I'm very sensible of the honor. So my subject today is one of the few of the most famous uh, geophysical features on the planet, namely the, the Hawaiian island chain. Perhaps only Iceland comes close in being known so well. I just want to acknowledge my co-workers here, Uli Christensen, uh, who's in now in Göttingen, uh, the late Laszlo Cerepes from Hungary, and more recently two people, N uh, Nazira Asadi and, and Fahad Sobuti from the Institute of Bas for Advanced Studies in Basic Sciences in Iran. So I'll start now with the, the basics of the, th of the three-dimensional model that we've built for the Hawaiian plume. We call it a Kleenex, Kleenex box model because it has rather those dimensions. And the, uh, the fundamental idea is that the Hawaiian plume uh, rises from here in this model from, oops, excuse me, from a, a hot anomaly which we, which we place on the bottom of the box. That's one source of the flow. The second component of flow is generated by this, the movement of the surface here to the right at some, at some speed u. That corresponds to roughly <coughs> 9 centimeters per year in the geological context. There's free outflow at the, at the downstream end, free inflow at the upstream end. The upper surface is, is at a constant temperature, which is colder, of course, than the hot anomaly down here. And nominally, we use a depth uh, of 400 kilometers for the, for the box. And in at the, at the uh, upstream end, the temperature profile, which is assumed, is an error function geotherm corresponding to cooling of the oceanic lithosphere. So just briefly, the, uh, the governing equations. Uh, I'll go lightly on the math here. First, conservation of mass, which is trivial. It just states that the velocity field is solenoidal. Conservation of momentum. Oops. Conservation of mo momentum here. Note the viscosity term here. The viscosity depends on temperature and on pressure. But there are two sources of buoyancy which have to be taken into, into account. This is a, the, the, what drives the plume uh, component of the flow. <coughs> the first is thermal buoyancy. And the second is melt depletion buoyancy due to the, <coughs> the extra dense, ex the, the, the low density of the residue of melting. We also have conservation of energy here. And finally, the evolution of the melt depletion function itself, which ranges from 0 to 1. You'll notice this odd, somewhat odd form. I say that it's the maximum of 0 and a convective rate of change of the equilibrium melt fraction. This equilibrium melt fraction, by the way, comes from the Mackenzie-Bickel uh, parameterization. But the this form here means that we have no freezing in the model. If, if melt is formed, we assume that it escapes upwards rapidly, and it's not in, it doesn't remain in contact with a matrix to freeze then if, you, if, you, if this quantity goes negative. So here now is a, a view of the solution. It's, uh, the box, remember, is 400 kilometers deep. The top 100 kilometers has been cut away here. So you see clearly the plume rising, very uh, concentrated hot anomaly here. It rises in the shear flow generated by the motion of this upper surface in this direction. And so it decelerates as it approaches the solid lithosphere, which is defined by the, the cold material at the top of the of the model domain. When it, as it decelerates, it, it can go, it 
move upstream a slight bit, but not very much because the, the velocity of the plate on the surf surface is carrying the, uh, the, the material down this way. So you get this rather par parabolic looking shape, which represents a, a, a balance between gravitational spreading of the material and advection of the material by the moving plate. So this is what the structure looks like if you take cutaway views. This is at, oops, at 110 kilometers depth here. So you have first the potential temperature of the model. That's here. It ranges from 1590 degrees down to 1240 here in this, this area. So you can see, the again, the, the quasi-parabolic shape of this. I'll be talking more in more detail about what that shape actually is. And you see here some streak-like patterns. Those are, in fact, small-scale convection uh, rolls in the, this plume puddle or plume head here. The second uh, image shows the de depletion caused by melting. You see it ranges up to about 13.6% here. <coughs> and the, the white, here you see again these streaks which correspond to small scale convection. And the white corresponds to material of the lowermost lithosphere that is simply falling down and, and therefore has no, uh, has a zero degree of melting. And finally, on the third slide here, third panel, you see the rate of melt production. So you have two distinct melting regimes. This one is the, is the main one, right above the plume stem. But there's also a secondary melting zone here, which I'll talk about in a moment. So here's the plume structure now uh, vertic in vertical planes, the vertical symmetry plane of the plume. So at top, you have, ter you have again the potential temperature of the plume running up to 1600 here. The black lines represent typical streamlines or path lines because this, this is a steady flow. It shows where the material goes. So something coming up right in the middle of the plume in the, in the hottest part would follow this line. And uh, material parcels from the closer to the edges would be following these two streamlines here. So secondly, you have the, the depletion F which is highest up here. You see this, this streamline, is, uh, is, is, there's ongoing melting as you move along this streamline. And so it reaches a, a, a depletion of about 19% here. And finally, I think the most interesting of, of these uh, slides or images is this one here, which shows, again, the rate of melt production. You see the two distinct regions here. The red, the red is the highest melt production. That occurs in the center of the plume as it rises. And here, of course, it's, it's decelerating, and so the melting rate decreases strongly around here. But then if you follow this streamline, you see it undergoes a first bit of melting here in the primary melt zone. But then there's a hiatus and a secondary melt zone farther downstream. And that's an important that's an important uh, aspect of this model. One thing we have to explain now is, uh, using a model like this, are the, uh, the eruption stages of Hawaiian volcanoes. This is a compilation from Clegg and Dalrymple a long time ago. And what I want to point out to you, oops, I want to point out to you primarily are these two islands, Kauai and Nihau. You'll notice that the, the uh, the, Hawaiian, the volcanism has four stages in Hawaii, generally. One talks about a shield <coughs> stage, a shield building stage, a pre-shield stage, a post-shield stage, and those are all together. And then after some hiatus, the rejuvenated stage, represented by the black here. So for Kauai and Nihihau, you have a long re rejuvenated stage. And so we have to explain why volcanism is occurring over this long time of about five and a half million years. Okay, well here is the uh, prediction of melt flux uh, compared with the observations. Here again are the two melting regions, and this one, this one is very weak indeed. 
So what, I, what I've done here is to try to match the total volume of the pre-shield, shield, and post-shield stages. Uh, that's these, these three objects here. I choose uh, a, a radius here of, ca of the catchment area, which, is, which gives, supplies melt to this region. And I want that to be the observed value, or observed estimate, of about 92,000 kilometers cubed. So that's, that's the only adjustment that's done in this, in this model to match that total amount of vulcan volcanic material. Well, in doing that, I didn't take any account of what, what went on further downstream. And surprisingly, you get something that's very uh, coherent with the observations. Here again are the, the dura duration for Kauai and Niihau of the post or the rejuvenated volcanic stage. And this, the, the rate of, uh, the maximum rate of uh, production is shown here multiplied by 100. So in <coughs> it's very small indeed. But I found also in looking at this that a walker in 1990 had made an independent estimate of the the intensity of this rejuvenated volcanism, and it falls right here. Again, it's multiplied, been, been multiplied by 100 because the, the, the amount of rejuvenated vo uh, volcanism is very small. So that's very coherent. It shows that the model can predict well the location and the intensity of this uh, rejuvenated stage. Just in case, just for the, for the, for the story, those of you who know Hawaii, uh, diamond head behind Honolulu is an example of rejuvenated stage volcanism. Okay, now I want to do some work on inversion for plume plume parameters. Now I want to look at the diff different constraints that one can make and, and how they can be exploited in the terms of a three-dimensional model. So I'm Looking at the, the, uh, the plume in the model, there are four poorly known parameters, at least four, but four in, I think is a sufficient number, of things we don't know and would like to know. The first, oh boy, the first is the lithospheric thickness right above the plume stem, which, which governs how high the plume is able to rise before it spreads laterally. The second is the buoyancy flux. Buoyancy flux is a measure of the strength of the plume. It's how fast buoyant material is being supplied through the plume stem up to the lithosphere. Also, the maximum potential temperature in the plume, which are called theta sub i. And finally, the minimum viscosity in the, in the head of the plume. So those are four parameters we'd like to know. And we ask now, what are the constraints on these parameters? Well, I've, with my colleagues, we judged that there were three good parameters to use, three robust constraints. The first is the maximum height of the swell, which is about 1,350 meters, plus or minus 100. The width of the swell at the hot spot, that's about 1,200 kilometers, with some error. And the melt production rate is given by this value here. So, so the inversion, inversion procedure is the following. We, we use uh, uh, something like 20 numerical solutions, 3D numerical solutions of the kind I showed you before, the Kleenex box solutions. And we use those to determine scaling laws for the parameters H, W, and M. Now, the, the reason for this is that you, it, it allows you to do a complete inversion because uh, evaluating the scaling law costs 10 to the minus ninth what it does to run the three-dimensional model. So if you can get everything in terms of sim simple scaling laws, you can very easily do inversions completely without any, any uh, assumptions needed. So you recall I had four parameters, but only three constraints. So I have to choose one of the parameters, which I'll take as uh, theta i, as an independent variable, which we don't know. And then for a range of these, this parameter, we determine the ranges of the lithospheric thickness, the buoyancy flux, and the viscosity that are compatible with the given ranges of these three parameters. <coughs> and so the result is not, is not a single model which is compatible with the observations, 
but it's, it's uh, the set of all models that are compatible with the observational constraints. And that, getting that is, uh, is a, a g an important reason to use scaling laws. So let me now show you a b briefly how the scaling laws are obtained. The idea for s of a scaling law is uh, not necessarily simply to fit data to some arbitrary function, but you start from a physical model, a, a model that, that embodies the essence of, of the essential physics of the situation. And one of those models is shown here. It's a, what's it called a lubrication theory model. It's the lubrication theory is a theory of the f viscous flow in thin layers of highly viscous fluid. And this, to understand this model, you can imagine uh, a, a holding a pitcher full of syrup and pouring it onto a, a continuously moving table. This is exactly that situation, but just up, the syrup is pouring upwards because, of course, it's less dense. But the principle is exactly the same. So I have here supply of fluid at a, a volumetric rate Q. The fluid's velocity is u, u, mu sub P. The density is less than the velocity outside by an amount delta P. And W of X is the half width of, the, of this plume puddle. Different words. Some some people use pond, some use puddle, some use pancake. But I'll, call, I'll call it pond for, for this talk. And again, here is the, uh, the movement of the plate at a velocity u. So you've got all, of the, all the essential ingredients of the three-dimensional di three model, which has this light plume material, or less dense plume material, spreading laterally by under gravity, at the same time as it's being infected downstream by the velocity u. So the governing equation looks like this. This is the advection term. This is the term that represents buoyant spreading. It's a nonlinear term, you know this. Here's a term that represents the fluid supply at this point. It represents the pipe, essentially. And this, this parameter here, which is, a, is buoyancy divided by viscosity, you can call a spreadability parameter. Obviously, the larger that is, the more effective uh, this uh, uh, gravitational spreading will be. And by doing a scaling analysis of these equations, you find the characteristic length scale and lateral scale <coughs> for the problem. So in the case of the length scale here, that, that means if I want my puddle of syrup to be twice as thick, I have to pour at a rate 16 times as fast. So, the first scaling, scaling laws for the swell height, we use dimensional analysis and the scaling analysis, and we <coughs> find something that looks, looks like this. You saw this before. This is the, this is the, uh, the height characteristic thickness of the puddle right here, and we multiply by the uh, ratio of the densities, and finally a function which is a, a function of a dimensionless group, a new one, q sigma over u squared. And we now, we do our 20 unit numerical solutions. We plot them as a function of this pi sub b, and we find that they all collapse onto a universal curve. So that gives us our function g. This is, the, this is the goal of scaling laws, really, is to get things to collapse on universal curves, because then you know you've got something you can use. So here's the scaling law for the width w of the plume. And this is based simply on, on uh, conservation of mass, conservation of flux. What did G capital? I'm sorry? What did G capital? Oh, that's the, that's the, that's this. Oops. This one? So it is actually the right hand side in the equation for H. Here? Yeah. I'm not sure I understand the question, but the <laughs> point is if you take you take all your you take all your solutions, I see, I divide see. by this. For I'm sorry. You divide by this, and what's left is G. I understood, I understood. And you just guess then because it seemed reasonable. I'm sorry? You just guessed this functional form because it seemed reasonable. No, I didn't. No, this is the functional form that comes out. 
you, it's these points, the, these circles and squares, which are the numerical results. They fall on this curve, and then just for, com for convenience, I give an explicit, an explicit form. Is the explicit form an actual solution of the governing equations? No. Or is it that right? It's Not just at all. simply a use of thing which fits. Exactly. That's all that a thought is. You know, in general, in dimensional analysis and, and scaling analysis, you get arbitrary functions. And you can't assume that they're power laws or something simple. They, according to dimensional analysis, they can be anything whatsoever. And in this case, I just chose a functional form that goes right through those points nicely, it's just, just for convenience. So the scaling law for the, the width, what I do now is, is write down oops, this law for the, for, the, for the width. Remember, you already saw this combination of parameters here, which was the scale for the width. And we simply divide by, by the previously determined function g. And we find that all of the, uh, the, the boundaries of the, of the plume pond collapse again onto a single curve when you rescale w x and y by w, the width. And again, I'm just take, taking a function, arbitrary function here, that goes right down the middle of these. You see the black line in there is, is this function. But that, again, is, has no relation to the direct to the, satis to the satis uh, solution of the governing equations. So finally, the scaling rate for the melting law M, I won't bother you with that. It's too long and long-winded to write up. But it basically says that the, <laughs> oh boy, the rate of melting is proportional to the buoyancy flux. That's fairly obvious. And then there's lots of other stuff that that's, uh, gives you this function here, but I won't try to write that down. So here are the results. So remember, I chose one parameter to be the free parameter. And that's the potential temperature, the maximum potential temperature in the plume. This point here is just the reference model, the one I, the one I showed you, the, the uh, cuts at 100 kilometers and so forth. So what, what do you see? Well, you, ch you choose this, you choose whichever value you like here, and then your, your best, your, your most probable value of, for example, viscosity <coughs> is here. The error bars on the on the uh, parameters define these green lines outside. So you're, you've got the best, the best fit here, but so the plus or minus 100 f uh, kilometers, for example, give, turns into these boundaries on the, re on the regime. Here, this is probably the most robust result. No matter what temperature you choose, you find that the buoyancy flux is rather <coughs> small. It's about three, three in these units of megagrams per second, which are traditionally used in this field. And no matter what temperature anomaly you, you choose, you get roughly that same value. Now that's, that's quite a bit weaker than, than uh, previous estimates of, of the plume buoyancy flux. I can go into that later if you want. The traditional models have no compositional buoyancy. That's one thing that's forgotten, yes. That's right. So uh, let me turn now to the geoid anomaly. You noticed when I said there were three robust constraints on our in inversion, I didn't mention anything about the geoid because the geoid is a very, it's a very controversial thing, very difficult to analyze, and I want to try to give you some sense of that now. So the, interest, the parameter of interest is the ratio of geoid to topography, sometimes called the admittance. I'll use GTR to denote that. <coughs> and the rule of thumb that geophysicists generally use is that the, this G, GTR, oh boy, this GTR in meters per kilometer is about one-tenth times the compensation depth of the, of the mass in kilometers. So I'll give you an, an example with two M-member models. This is a, a model that was proposed back in the 70s by Dietrich and Crow, the thermal rejuvenation model. What they posited was a plate moving horizontally at some normal speed, 10 centimeters a, a year, for example. And suddenly, from a, from a source whose identity wasn't entirely clear, presumably a plume, 
there's an input of heat into the lithosphere. That thins the lithosphere very rapidly according to the model and means that your, uh, the buoyant <coughs> material is contained where there used to be denser or colder lithospheric material in here. And that gives you a low GTR of 4 to 5 meters per kilometer because your buoyant material is, is where the lith lithosphere used to be. The second model is the dynamic support model. Again, it's quite old, has a long pedigree. And that model assumes that there is a plume rising and spreading against the base of the lithosphere without much thinning of that lithosphere and gives you a high GTR of about 8 meters per kilometer. So here is a, the basic, uh, a basic approach that was followed by Marks and Sandwell, for example, in, back in 1991, is to use, uh, to look at points distributed over the Hawaiian swell and to, count, to, write, to plot the geoid on the vertical axis, the topography on the horizontal axis. And when you do that for several hundred points, you take, the, you take a regression line through it and you get 4.6 meters per kilometer. So that's about, those are the, that's a typical value for the thermal rejuvenation model. However, there's a problem there. And the idea here is that the GTR inferences made in that way are contaminated by shallowly compensated volcanic topography that bandpass filtering fails to remove. In fact, the, the lower limit of the bandpass filter that M Marks and Sandwell applied was about 400 kilometers. And at that, uh, that uh, length scale, you've still got an important effect of the flectural, the flecture of the lithosphere and the presence of the volcanic islands that causes trouble for you. So we tried to do a, a, an approach to, to isolate the error, the error involved. So the test is first, excuse me, here is to do, a, do our 3D model, which predicts a melt flux, but we don't, put, we don't place that melt formed on top of the lithosphere. So this is a, without volcanic loading. The geoid anomaly looks like this. We then apply exactly the bandpass filter that Marks and Sandwell did, and we find this array, very tight array of points of geoid versus topography, and a slope of 7.7 .7 meters per kilometer. So now we do a, 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 a variant of that. We do a 3D model with volcanic loading. Remember, we, since we're, pr we're predicting the am amount of melt production, we can simply place that melt formed on top of the lithosphere as we go along and calculate the deflection of the lithosphere that, that that would produce. And then we do the same bandpass filter that Marks and Sandwell used. And we find now, if we take all those points into account, we find a slope of 4.4 meters per kilometer. So what that means is that the, the presence of this volcanic ridge here and the, and the flexure of the lithosphere produced by that strongly contaminates your admittance and so you get these small, very small values. So the conclusion is that the true ge uh, geoid to topography ratio of the swell is around 8 meters per kilometer and not 4.4. Not, uh, However, things have gotten more complicated and interesting in the past few years. I just wanted to cite some work by uh, Cecilia Cadio and company who did a wavelet analysis of the Hawaiian swell, uh, the geoid and topography. So wavelet analysis basically tells you at a given position and as a function of horizontal scale what your admittance is. So the, the strongly coherent uh, results they have are to the left of this line. So this, this part here is really not to, be, not to be interpreted. And you see here's the, the admittance in meters per kilometer going up, going up to about 8. So down here, in fact, at Hawaii, <coughs> you do find an admittance of 8 meters per kilometer. But as you move up, move along the chain, you find that this decreases. 
And so here you're getting admittances of around 5 to 6. So what that suggests is that the compensating density anomaly uh, for the Hawaiian swell is gradually moving upward as you move along northwestward along the swell. Uh, and that means, presumably, that there's lithospheric thinning going on. So the, the uh, light material is, is at effectively a, at a higher elevation. I wanted to just uh, mention another intriguing suggestion that's been made recently um, concerning the seismic tomography uh, and its observation of two plume pools or ponds. This is work that's based on some recent seismological data. These are shear wave velocity perturbations shown as a function of depth. <coughs> you see 100 kilometers, 200, 300. So at 100 kilometers, you see clearly these, <coughs> these anomalies here, which suggest a, a sort of a puddle-like or pond-like structure. Nothing much at 200 kilometers. But then at 300 kilometers, you see again an, uh, an array of, of anomalies which s suggests a, a ponding as well. And so the interpretation of this is that there are maybe two ponds, in fact. So this is work of Maxime Balmer recently, in which he posits a two-pool or two-pond structure of a Hawaiian plume. So you, what, he's, what he uh, imagines is a plume rising here, containing a, li a lighter component, a <coughs> peridotite component, and a denser component, uh, eclogite component, mixed together. And at the, at the depth of about, of about 300 kilometers, the, the density difference between those two phases is maximum. And so he, they pr propose that the denser component is remaining at this level and spreading to form a pool. And then from the top of that pool, you have a mostly peridotite plume rising further and spreading into a second pool, which is closer to the base of the lithosphere. So the, the pond or pool that I've been talking about is essentially this one up here, according to this model. One thing they haven't done yet, I asked them about this, is to check the effect on the geoid. Right? This, <coughs> is a, this is a negatively buoyant material, quite a bit of it. So it's clearly going to have some effect on the geoid. And it has to have a, a larger geoid to topography ratio because it's so deep. But that, I don't believe, has been done yet. There are some circulations. I'm sorry? Is it possible you have some circulations of the flow? Yes. Well, what they, what they find, they have the, the eclogite, excuse me, the eclogite separating from the, from the peridotite component at this depth. And the peridotite component is going around like this. I haven't examined the, the solutions in detail myself, so that's, I'm just going by what Maxime Baumann has told me. Are those standing waves around the lower pool or traveling waves? Well, they're not, they're not waves in the sense that there's no inertia in, in the... <coughs> there's, there's, it's, in one model, it's steady state. In another model, it's time dependent. I'm just showing a steady state case here. So I want to finish by... Uh, the question of how do we interpret, interpret the shape of the Hawaiian swell. Now one thing, uh, what motivates this study is uh, an insufficiency of the model that I described to you early on, and that is that the swell shape predicted by a model with Newtonian or linear rheology widens too rapidly downstream compared to the observations. So the the, one of the best fitting models here is shown as, as this red line. That's the edge of the plume pond. And as you can see, it's, it's, it's going quite far uh, afield relative to this fairly uh, <coughs> narrow, well, much narrower uh, shape of the Hawaiian swell. So it's a problem of, of uh, widening too rapidly that we have to examine. 
So the question I'm going to ask then is how does rheology affect the shape of the Hawaiian swell? This is something that's not been looked at yet as far as I know. So this here you see is the, the residual topography relative to a thermal cooling model of Stein and Stein, this one. Um, what's, no, what's noticeable and striking in this is that the, the uh, amplitude of the topography on the flanks here is roughly the same here and here, here and here. There's a part in the middle where it's much less. That presumably represents a, a time when the flux of the plume was somewhat less than it is today. But the question remains, how do we get a, 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 a Hawaiian swell which has essentially a constant amplitude over such a long distance? So this purple line here is just indicating the, the parts of the swell which I'm going to exclude from the analysis because the, everything in here is dominated by the presence of the volcanic islands and the flexural moat, the, the bending of the lithosphere that those islands create. So I'm going to show that a, a lubrication model, but now with nonlinear rheology. <coughs> So the power of the rheology has the form of a power law. The strain rate is proportional to the nth power of the stress with a constant of proportionality d. And putting in the explicit expression for the, the strain rate, we have the viscosity which depends, uh, which is proportional to the strain rate <coughs> to this power 1 minus n over n. That's valid, of course, for a, for a Newtonian fluid, n equals 1. But it's, we think that in the Earth, uh, olivine deforms according to, with the power law of n equals 3.5, roughly. So we put that into the same sort of an equation I showed you before, where now we, we, we want to keep an unsteady term, advection of, of the thickness of this the puddle, a gravitational spreading term, which is even more nonlinear than the one you saw before, and a fluid supply term, which represents the fluid being supplied by the, 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 uh, the plume pipe. The spreadability parameter takes it to somewhat more complicated form, but it's still the same idea. It's buoyancy over viscosity, roughly speaking. The scale for the plume width that comes out of this is, uh, by a scaling analysis of the equations, is this rather complicated affair, which again reduces to what we saw before if n equals 1. And so I'll call that L, L sub 0. And then finally, the scale for the topography amplitude is this. You see the scale L sub 0 appears there, and it's given by this. So let's look now at a, at a downstream similarity solution. We're supposing that we're, we're quite far now from the, uh, from the plume stem under the big island of Hawaii. We're, f we're far downstream relative to that. And at those distances, we expect transverse spreading, gravitational spreading, to be much, much greater than the along axis spreading. The, the largest gradients in the thickness of the plume are, are uh, perpendicular to the plume's motion. So we can look for a solution then. We, we have to satisfy, of course, this equation of flux conservation. M is greater than 1 or less than 1? M. M, M, small m. Oh, m. small n. Greater than 1 or less than 1? Right. Yes, small n was here. Right there. Greater than 1. That's the same n. So the, the, in the rheological law simply states that the strain rate is proportional to stress to the nth power. The question is, are you only considering n is larger than one? Than one? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Yes, the, the, uh, the only possibility is for n to be larger than 1. That's based on experiments, which show for olivine that n equals roughly 3.5. And that's called a, a, a shear thinning fluid. So the viscosity gets, gets smaller as you increase the shear rate. 
but shear thickening fluids also exist. It's just not geologically reasonable. Neil, could N depend on the temperature or on the position one way or another? Not directly on the temperature, but it's, there, are, there are complicated maps of where you would expect uh, power law creep or linear creep. And they're not always very consistent among themselves. But the idea here is to use the Hawaiian swell as a kind of rheometer, so to speak, of the material compensating the swell. So I won't, I won't make a claim that everything is in the Earth has this same rheology. I'm just, I'm just making the conclusion about what's the material co compensating the Hawaiian swell. Okay, so to get a self-similar solution, this is a, uh, a nice, it's always nice if you can get a self-similar solution um, because it it's a, represents a nice balance between two physical forces here, or, or, or physical factors. Here you have a balance between the gravitational spreading term and the advection of the thickness or of, of thickness gradients. So the self-similar form is this. You assume by, by conservation of mass, you know that Q has to be equal or proportional to U times the characteristic thickness H. And so that's, that gives you this part here. <coughs> And then h is a function of a similarity variable, which is y over the, the width of the, of the uh, puddle. <coughs> so that if you solve this out, there's an analytical solution available, which I didn't write down for you. But you find that the topography on the axis, x, the symmetry axis, y equals 0, has this form. So far downstream from the source, you find that the topography decays according to a minus 1 over 3n plus 2 power. And now those uh, are evaluated here. If you have a Newtonian fluid, the standard case, for n equals 1, you find that the topography, topography decays as distance to the minus 1 fifth power. If you have, by, uh, by contrast, a, a non-Newtonian law with n equals 3.5, s decreases as uh, distance to the minus 0 0.08 power. So that means that the rate of decay of the swell topography is a sensitive rheological indicator. So your solution is along the symmetry axis. That's right. But you have no data on the symmetry axis because it's contaminated by volcanic rocks. That's right. I'm using, using the exterior. Well, th this, let me see, just a moment. The solution is everywhere. This is, just an, this is just an extract from the solution, evaluating the solution at the central axis. But you know everywhere what the, what the solution is. But you're absolutely right. The, since there's topography excluded in the middle, you have to use this, the solution out at the sides. <laughs> I'm sorry? Maybe I missed that. It looks like that's good for infinity. X goes to X and Y. Yes, but that's, uh, of course it breaks down near the source. Yeah. Would you mind repeating the question before you answer it? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I should. Yes, the question was about this. This seems to go to, to blow up <coughs> when x equals x. Well, the, the x naught, as I recall, is about 100 kilometers or so, according to the fit that I did. So you're a few hundred kilometers downstream, you're fine. Neil, I mean, to do this, you you assume a singular source, right? I mean, that's one of the assumptions you made to get a similarity solution. In other words, your original equations had a, a Gaussian flux. That's right. But here you've assumed a singular. I mean, you've assumed that's a, right. That's why you have a sing, your singular at x equals zero. Well, in fact, it, yeah, that's right. Right. So that's the only. I mean, yeah. That's just an assumption of your boundary condition at x equals zero. Yes, that's right. That's right. Yeah. The x naught is is a lot. It's right. the off. It's a, it's effectively the, the the point with respect to which the solution is self-similar. Right. I mean, all gravity current solutions are singular at x equals zero. Yeah, yeah, right, right. But you don't care because you're far downstream from that. So these are the solutions. Sort of, they're universal numerical solutions for a steady plume. So here at the top is n equals 1, and you can see how it's widening as a function of distance quite, quite uh, 
substantially. This is the solution for n equals 3.5. And as you can see, the, the decay, for example, along this line here, is much, much slower than it is along this line here. So we're going to see if this can explain the kind of enigmatic observations in Hawaii. So here is the observed versus predicted topography. Now I'm accounting for a time variable plume flux because we have the, the, this part in here we know is, is, uh, represents a, a diminution in the plume flux relative to the, to the average value over time. So if you look down here, I'll just <coughs> point out a few things in, the, in, in order. First of all, the green contour represents all the topography that's being ignored because that's dominated by the volcanic load loading. So we're looking now at the, out, the parts outside of those green contours. So if you try to do, do the best fit now with n equals 1 with a Newtonian rheology, you can <coughs> find this for the 700 meter contour. And that's to be compared with the 700 meter contour that's observed, which is the black line. So as you see, in the Newtonian case, can't explain these very high, high uh, very low amplitude, uh, no, excuse me, high amplitude features out here. But if you now take uh, a fluid with n equals 3.5, you find a much better fit. You find mm -hmm. that you, you can explain this high, these high, uh, high amplitude regions out here. So that suggests that the rheology of this material compensating the swell may be uh, uh, correspond to dislocation creep with n equals 3.5, roughly. Okay, well, let me just finish now with a few conclusions and, and perspectives. So we saw, and first of all, the 3D plume model that I showed you, the Kleenex box model, successfully predicts the location and intensity of post-erosional volcanism. And I just want to, to estimate, to, to emphasize that there was, there was no fitting done to, to get that result. It was just, uh, it was uh, simply a... a, a a nice surprise that we, that we found that that was the case. The inversion of scaling laws that I showed you for the Hawaiian plume parameters strongly constrains the plume's buoyancy flux. This is the, the strongest constraint, I think, that comes out of that analysis. To between 2,200 and 3,500 of these, in these units, which again is two to three, a factor of two to three smaller than in previous uh, analyses. Next, the rate of downstream decay of the Hawaiian swell implies that the material compensating it has a power law rheology. We can't determine exactly the power law, but 3.5 seems to work fairly well. Comparison of that rheology uh, uh, with laboratory data, which is an important thing to do. I didn't show you the details. It's about four times too stiff in the model relative to the laboratory data. But again, the uncer uncertainties are very large, both in the data, the extrapolation over many orders of magnitude of strain rate, and of course, the simplifications in the, in the model. So it's not surprising you get some discrepancy. Then to the geoid, the, the GTR of the Hawaiian swell is eight meters per kilometer, roughly near the hot spot, and diminishes downstream, reflecting progressive erosion of the lithosphere by the plume. And so finally, just to mention some work in progress with uh, Cecilia Cadio, we're working on a lubrication model with the combined effects of nonlinear rheology and lithospheric erosion. And the reason for that is because the two effects can have similar, uh, similar effects on the width of the swell. That right? if you're eroding the lithosphere, you're essentially conf confining the channel to, to near the axis of the, of the uh, swell. And that can give you a similar uh, narrowing of the plume as nonlinear rheology. So we're trying to tr determine what the trade-off is between those two effects. So that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Neil. Oh, a lot of questions. Paul. Are the first and third conclusions there internally consistent? 
In other words, if you go back and run the 3D model with the nonlinear rheology, do you still get the second bounce? Sorry, I did not. Uh, can you the second bounce. The, post -ero the, the downstream upwelling that gives you the post erosional volcanism was, oh. run, it was run in a linear model. That's right. So if you go back and do it in a nonlinear model, Good you don't point. have as much spreading of the plume, I infer that you probably don't have that secondary upwelling. That's possible. I haven't done it. It's a good suggestion. I haven't done it. So I was wondering, in the case that you were showing um, the GTR ratio between the two sets of runs earlier on, where you said you were taking into account of the volcanic loading, where you assume oh, yes. that um, the melt gets placed immediately on the top, and hence you came up with uh, the, the fit yielded a 4.4 uh, value. Now, I was wondering if, if it so happened that some of the melt also gets infected by the plume and does not get placed immediately on top. Would you still get the same type of GTR? Well, we haven't we haven't tried it. I'm sure it would be different, but the assumption, the assumption we're making seems to be reasonable since there obviously the melt is is in place on the, on the lithosphere. Um, we're just we did it as a continuous ridge. We didn't try to create separate islands. That answer your question. I'm not, I'm not sure. Partially. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Thank you. Uh, yeah, just related to this, how do you get the right amplitude for the geoid um, when you're doing it on a Cartesian box? Oh well, that's just it's just by integration. You just do the gravitational potential of the box. And that's right. Just just inter integrate over the, the the density anomalies and the surface deformation. <coughs> fits the amplitude of the Earth so well. Yes, surprising, but nice. <laughs> <laughs> Point of clarification. Your, your lubrication theory, does it take account of, of, of the, the diffusion of the temperature? No, it does not. But in fact, the re we checked that very carefully. We went to, I could show you, let me see if I can get up there. I think I've got some extra slides about that. Yes, here we go. This is the test we made to, to examine that very question. So on the, on the left you see the uh, lubrication theory with n equals, n equals 1. This is the, the, the 3D solution for a particular case. And we then calculated the axial topography, the topography right along this line, decaying downstream. And we get this is what we get. So it's, it's, you get a minus one fifth power, as the this, as this similarity solution would suggest. This is a case with non Newtonian analogy, n equals 3.5. <coughs> and here, if you do the, the fit of the topography, you get very, ni very nicely a slope of negative 0.5. 0 0.08. That's quite distinguishable from the minus one fifth power that you would get for a Newtonian rheology. So yes, we tested the, f the fact that the constancy of the viscosity in the, in the lubrication model does not affect the essential physics. Is it suppressing the small scale convection? I'm when sorry? you switch to a, a dislocation creep regime? Well, there was, there was none here. I'm not sure why. I would think it, I think I would think it should be enhanced. That's probably what you're referring to. Yeah. That's what I'm I would guess too, but it was not. Of course, this is this is not very far. I didn't take the solution out much further because, for example, here in the Newtonian case, you have small scale convection developing, but at some distance for downstream. It could be that you just need a longer distance downstream for it to start going. That's all I can think of. Here's the model you need to answer my question. You've already run it. Yes, that would be good. Um, Mark. Just a clarification question. What is the mechanism that creates the melting further down in the linear model? Is it the small scale convection or is it? <coughs> no, it's, no, it's more robust than that. Let me see if I can.
Sorry, it takes a moment. Yeah, is this what you're referring to? Yeah. Yeah. Well, what's happening is that this, if you follow par a particle along this streamline here, it's melting just a little bit on the edges, and then it goes down. It goes down slightly instead of up. <laughs> and then it starts going up again, and that's where it melts. So the question then that you're asking essentially is why does it go down there? That's, that's the, the question becomes that. Well, I've, if you look at the uh, solution for a, a, a simple isoviscous uh, plume rising and, and striking a lithosphere and going out, you see that the streamlines actually go down as the material moves outwards. I don't think I can give a, a more preci precise answer than that. I can't say why it moves down, but it's, ju it's, it's seen in a very simple case. So in the lubrication model, did the thickness of the lubricating layer is also non-monotone? No, it's monotonic. So no, it, it, the lubrication model cannot predict this. Is it hoop stresses of the radially expanding plume? I'm sorry? Is it, is it hoop stress of the radially expa expanding plume uh, providing a resistance to outward spreading that um, can't quite keep up with the, with the supply from below? I mean, well, I don't, I don't think so. There, this, the stress is uh, uh, exerted by the outer fluid on the plume. Is that what you're referring to? The stress is uh, due to the external fluid? That's not what I was... No, okay, I didn't, I didn't understand then. What I was thinking of is the, is the sort of the hoop stress. As you take a ring of material and, and it expands outward, okay. it's, it's extending. Yes, so okay. There's some resistance to that. Okay, if sure. If that resistance is sufficiently large, then it tends to, it would tend to hold the, the material inward, maybe in excess of the buoyancy flux. Hmm, so that okay. Create okay. a force driving uh, uh -huh. to go back down. I mean, it's probably not worth the... I don't think that's, in a lubrication uh, approximation, there is, there is no... Yeah, that's right. But in the 3D like model there. Yeah, in the 3D model there would be. But I haven't calculated it, I'm sorry. Question in that. Oh. Uh, my question is, uh, can you show me once more your equation with uh, 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 gradient h into n minus 1? Just small comment. Which equation? This equation with... Um, Gradient h into n minus one, and then gradient of h into order n gravity plus three. Yeah. It's a nonlinear gravity, non gravity current. Nonlinear gravity current, right? Parabolic equation. Down on here. Yes. Yeah, this one. There. Yeah. Okay. I just want to point out that uh, this type of nonlinearity leads to a finite speed of propagation, and there is a Barenboim type of solution, which maybe will explain why n equal 1, you have uh, not as wide front as in case n greater than 1. Well, I think the, the reason why you get a narrower plume in this case <coughs> is that the viscosity is a function of strain rate. The highest strain rates are in the middle of your plume, near the axis, and as you move out towards the edges, the strain rate gets smaller. So no, the viscosity no, gets higher. No, I'm just saying a pure mathematical result. If n greater than 1, you have a tighter uh, uh, impact of the flux. Uh, it, it just uh, the so-called phenomenon of finite speed of propagation. Uh, I will give you references. Okay, okay, because the Newtonian... It can be, uh, that will be very useful for interpretation of results. It's pure mathematical result. Okay, yes please, let's talk about it afterwards. I'd like to see that. Do we have any further questions? I think we can ask them over wine, which should be waiting outside, hopefully. So can I just thank uh, Neil Ruby and all of today's uh, speakers once again. Thank you very much.